Shri Society of Ambedkar University, Delhi would like to um, welcome you to our second lecture of our ongoing lecture series that celebrates 75 years of Indian independence. So, we learn about history and gain knowledge about history and different aspects of history that are outside the classroom setup. So we have been organizing discussions and lectures and like we've been inviting eminent historians and professors for that. And we've also been organizing heritage walks. So basically, without this is basically History Society's purpose in a nutshell. And without taking much of your time, I would like to welcome Dr. Chris Mopat, who is not only an eminent, a renowned eminent historian, he's also a senior lecturer at Queen Mary University, London. And the topic for today's lecture is Infinite Incollapse. The Afterlives of Bhagat Singh. So thank you for joining and I would like to hand it over to our program coordinator, Professor Yogesh. Thank you, Prapti, uh, for the brief crisp introduction of History Society. Um, this lecture series that we have tried to curate for the current semester cycle, which obviously is delayed due to pandemic situation, uh, is, is attempting to investigate um, the last 75 years of uh, history post the independence. So not necessarily looking only at the period after independence, but also trying to look at the period before the independence to be able to investigate how uh, do we understand the idea of independence? How do we understand the idea of freedom? And therefore, the lectures that we are trying to curate over a period of time in the coming weeks also would investigate ideas of democracy, freedom, uh, revolution, expression of uh, uh, partition, its literature, and other dimensions. So uh, we hope to have some interesting, vibrant discussions in the coming semester also. Uh, uh, but formally, let me uh, welcome uh, Chris Mofa, who teaches uh, at uh, the University uh, in London. Uh, he'll be formally introduced by, obviously, Dr. Dhiraj. And we are joined by Dr. Dhiraj, uh, who will be chairing the session for today. Uh, without much ado, I will now hand over to Dheeraj. Dheeraj? Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, as all of you uh, all of you are aware of the plan laid out by History Society, this is one of the events uh, in the series of events that they have been undertaking. So I welcome on behalf of History Society AUD, our uh, speaker today, Dr. Chris Mufat. And all of you are aware of uh, that he is a faculty at Queen Mary University of London and known for a significant list of uh, output. The latest one includes India's revolutionary inheritance, politics and the promise of Bhagat Singh, published from Cambridge University 2019. Besides this monograph, uh, we see also a long list of journal articles and uh, edited volume chapters etc some of them are related to bhagat singh but he has his publication on uh, a diverse uh, array of uh, issues such as history in pakistan and the will to architecture published in comparative studies of south asia africa and the middle east then you have uh, politics and the work of the dead in modern India, published in comparative studies in society and history, then building, dwelling, dying, architecture and history in Pakistan, published in modern intellectual history, the itinerant library of Lala Lajpat Rai, published in history workshop journal. So he represents a diverse array of themes on which he has been contributing to our understanding of those subjects. Today, he is uh, going to speak on the afterlife of uh, revolutionary Bhagat Singh, on which he has a full length uh, monograph published in 2019. And uh, we look forward to it. It's, uh, of course, as Dr. Yogesh uh, informed all of us, uh, quite pertinent in the series of events related to 75 years of our independence. All of you are aware that the parliament still doesn't have the a statue of this remarkably uh, poignant 
revolutionary character of the Indian freedom struggle. Nonetheless, he has been living in the heart of all uh, individuals who look forward to an egalitarian and free uh, South Asia. South Asia as a whole, because he represented a very broad uh, definition of nationalism. So now, without further delay, Chris, over to you. We look forward to your discussion. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Dheeraj, for the really warm introduction, very generous introduction. Um, and I just wanted to also thank um, Yogesh and Pratap for, for the original invitation to be here. Um, and also to Prapati for the, for the um, introduction to the History Society um, that she just offered. Um, it is a huge privilege to be part of this um, lecture series. Um, I look forward to learning from all of you in the discussion after the talk. Um, my only regret is that I'm not in uh, Delhi with you at the moment, although um, I hope in when things are a little more, um, yeah, a little less kind of uh, restricted globally because of this pandemic that I will be able to visit in person at some point. Um, but uh, I look forward to, to, to the discussion today. So I'm just going to share my screen. Um, and Dheeraj, maybe if you could just tell me that this is um, full screen for you um, in a moment. Can you, is that full screen for you? Yes. Yeah, yes. okay, great. The, now, I can't, I can no longer see the window because I can just see my PowerPoint. So if, if there is any issue, please just interject with, um, with your voice because I won't be able to see the, the call. So I was kindly invited to talk about um, this book, uh, India's Revolutionary Inheritance, which, um, as the Arch mentioned, was published in 2019. Um, I recognize that was a couple of years ago, but I do think that it still has a lot of um, uh, relevance for the, the series that, um, that Ambedkar University Delhi is, uh, the History Society is, is running, um, especially around these ideas of what freedom means after um, after independence. Um, the book centers on the 1920s anti-colonial revolutionary Bhagat Singh, but I'm also interested in uh, approaching the celebrated revolutionary as a case study to think about the conceptual and methodological problem of afterlives in politics. Right? Afterlives in politics. So what do I mean by afterlives? By afterlives, I'm referring to the continuing political potential of the dead in the present, right? the continuing political potential of those who have passed, those who have been martyred, like Bhagat Singh, uh, in the present. And the question of how we as, as historians might think about the politics of inheritance, which uh, living communities uh, experience a sense of debt or duty to the dead and act in an attempt to honor that sense of responsibility. Right? So afterlives is a phenomenon that's not limited to Bhagat Singh. And so I'm sure in our general discussion after the talk, um, we can explore this further. I would love to hear from you about the different ways we can think about heroic figures from the past or indeed villains and oppressors who continue to have an effect on politics in the present, even you know decades, centuries after they, they, they um, were alive or were living. But first, let me say a little bit about Bhagat Singh, who I know will be very well known to you. Um, this particular photo uh, was taken in 1929 at a studio um, near Kashmiri Gate in Delhi. Um, he was 20 years old at this time. And you'll know that Bhagat Singh's appearance on the stage of anti-colonial politics in India was very brief. Right? He was part of this uh, wave of radical youth action in the late 1920s. Uh, he helped establish an underground revolutionary organization called the Hindustan Socialist Republican Association, the HSRA. Um, and this was informed by two developments, right? the emergence of uh, a mass movement by, uh, led by Gandhi, right? but also a disillusionment with Gandhi's nonviolence, um, his, his platform of nonviolence. Um, and second, the world historical example of the Bolshevik revolution in India. Russia, right? The signal uh, in 1917 that a new form of society was possible, right? So the uh, kind of... Excuse me, Chris, your, yep. your slide is not moving. Are you moving it or just a static? 
it should be a picture of Bhagat saying at this. It's not showing at this moment. Possibly you just check. Ah, now it's fine. Okay. Now it is should fine. I, should I, um, if I do it full screen, is it changing now? Uh, it, it just changed. It, for the first time, it changed, yeah. OK, sorry. OK, so if you're seeing a photo of Bhagat Singh now, and I'll, um, I'll let you know when I change the slide next, and you can let me know if it works. Sorry about that. So a few months after the HSRA was founded in December 1928, the revolutionaries executed their first action, which was the assassination of a police officer in Lahore. In April 1929, four days after this portrait was taken, Bhagat Singh and his HSRA comrade, Bhattakeshwar Dutt, would throw a bomb into the Legislative Assembly in New Delhi at the very moment the colonial government was passing legislation to crack down on trade union mobilization. And I've changed the slide. I hope you can see an image of um, uh, Bhagat Singh throwing a bomb into the Legislative Assembly. The bomb was designed as a spectacle and, and it killed no one. It was thrown alongside pamphlets quoting the French anarchist Auguste Vellant and his assertion that it takes a loud voice to make the deaf hear. Both Bhagat Singh and Dutt immediately... Uh, excuse me. I think we're still in the Bhagat Singh photo. Okay. Okay. So uh, maybe is this better now? You can see? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes it just changed. Yeah. Okay, in that case, I will just leave it so it's not full screen, if that's all right. I know it's not. Um, um, and I'll just uh, change the slides this way. Okay. So both Bhagat Singh and Dutt um, immediately surrendered to police. They hoped to use the courtroom as a platform to publicize their revolutionary cause. And eventually, uh, Bhagat Singh was tied to the assassination in Lahore. He was sentenced to death. Uh, and on the 23rd of March, 1931, he was hanged on the gallows in Lahore Central Jail. And this is an image uh, which was uh, circulated uh, soon after his death. And it gives you an idea of how he was already being portrayed in popular uh, uh, bizarre art, uh, popular iconography, where he is giving his head in service to Bharat Mata. So the brevity of Bhagat Singh's political career contrasts sharply with his extraordinary popular afterlife in India. Dislocated from the partisan political milieu of interwar India, he stands in the 21st century as an icon of heroic self-sacrifice, an injunction to stand against tyrants, to never back down, never surrender. He is routinely invoked from the Hindu right, to the Maoist left, the army in India, to pacifists in Pakistan, environmentalist youth groups, the Khalistani secessionists. And there are statues everywhere, um, from the heart of uh, the government complex. Um, the statue on the left is uh, outside the Lok Sabha, and it is the, the very building that he, he bombed in 1929, right? Um, to these smaller um, statues at the heart of, um, uh, of urban or rural chalks. The, the one on the right is from Ferozpur. Um, biographers of Bhagat Singh have uh, not taken well to this sort of ideological promiscuity, right? The, the way in which he is uh, celebrated across the political spectrum. They interpret it as a lack of comprehension uh, or a willful distortion of one of the subcontinent's most significant revolutionary thinkers, right? So great effort has been uh, has been given to reconstruct the real Bhagat Singh, to determine what exactly he was fighting for, what future he envisioned for his country. So was he a communist? Was he an anarchist? Did he remain a Sikh or was he an atheist? And this is all very important work. Um, and uh, as, as, as some of you will know, this is uh, there's been kind of tremendous work by people like Chamalal, Jagmohan Singh, um, and others to, to find Bhagat Singh's writings and, and, and identify um, uh, his, his political program. My own research has not been so much focused on reconstructing Bhagat Singh's um, program. I have not tried to make a claim over the right or wrong way to understand Bhagat Singh and his politics. Um, and instead, I've been interested precisely in the problem of how and why he appeals to so many different people across so many different political projects. So for me, this ideological 
uh, range, this breadth, allows us to raise some interesting questions. Uh, one, about the public life of anti-colonial histories in India after independence, which I think is of relevance again to this um, seminar series. And B, the continued romance attached to uh, Bhagat Singh's brand of uncompromising, self-sacrificing radical politics in the present. Right. So I'm interested less in reconstructing Bhagat Singh's program than in exploring the promise that he is seen to represent. And that's the, the that's indicated in my book title, The Promise of Bhagat Singh. So today I want to talk a bit about this and suggest why it might be important for us as critical historians, as social scientists, um, to think about afterlives and the role of the revolutionary dead as active agitators and interlocutors in contemporary politics, even today, in Bhagat Singh's case, some 90 years after his death. Active agitators and interlocutors. I say active interlocutors or active agitators um, in the sense that Bhagat Singh is still seen uh, as able to inspire people to action, right? An active interlocutor in the sense that Bhagat Singh's ideas are still seen to be relevant in different ways. So there are two conceivable ways to think about uh, afterlives in politics. One, the manner in which the living willfully conjure the dead, appropriating um, figures from the past as resources or symbols in the present. Second, there is the more provocative possibility that the dead might themselves conjure politics, that the memory of the dead generations weighs down on the living, it calls us to responsibility, it incites us to action. And this is a difference in my work between a history of reception on the one hand, or how, how the past is received, appropriated in the present, and acknowledging the possibility of a haunting. And by haunting, I do not mean that ghosts literally or actually exist. I don't mean to suggest um, that, that there is some sort of spectral figure of Bhagat Singh. Um, haunting uh, contemporary India, but I want to signal an experience of uh, politics in the present that departs from that sort of ordered sequence between past, present, and future that defines our discipline of history. Right? Haunting is perhaps best understood as, as, as a place where history kind of stutters or stalls, right? Where something that is supposed to be over and done with, something that's supposed to be in the past, uh, is, is in fact still with us, right? Something that is supposed to be dead and gone continues to exert an influence on the living. So this is one of the central ideas of my book, that, that Bhagat Singh's work in the present um, it is as an instigator of politics, that he continues to instigate politics and revolution. And the reason he is such a powerful figure in this way is uh, related, again, to his status as Shahid Azam as, as, as a kind of the great martyr figure to this, the, the way he, he, um, he is seen to have died for a cause that is greater than himself, right? And so the nature of his death is crucial. As I mentioned earlier, Bhagat Singh was executed by British colonial authorities in March 1931. He was charged with conspiring to wage war against the King Emperor. And his hanging came at the end of a protracted high profile court case, the Lahore conspiracy case. Uh, and it was his continued defiance uh, of the authority of the court that catapulted him onto the national stage. In the first place, the revolutionary uh, owned up completely to what he had done. He never contested the charges against him. But what he did do was contest the court's claim to represent justice. He used the trial as a stage to make speeches, to shout slogans, to denounce British imperialism, and so on. Actions that were eagerly recorded by the observant nationalist press. And this was importantly a confident, swaggering, a very masculine performance. Bhagat Singh is, is described in newspaper accounts of the time as twisting his mustache defiantly in front of the judge, of getting into fights with prison guards, of remaining totally unafraid under the threat of death. And indeed, when the death sentence was announced, Bhagat Singh thanked the judge for the opportunity to prove his conviction. Um, as the story goes, he sang a song on his march to the gallows. He kissed the hangman's noose. 
and showed it in Kalab Sindabad, Long Live Revolution, which is his final breath. So this hanging in Lahore Central Jail provides the centerpiece of my book, and I just wanted to read a short extract from that um, briefly now. Shouts emerge from jail, reported the Lahore Tribune following the events of 23rd March, 1931. Bhagat Singh, Rajguru, and Sukhdev executed. So as many of you will know, Bhagat Singh did not, he was not executed in his own. He was uh, executed with two uh, comrades, um, Rajguru and Sukhdev. The government's attempt to avoid a public spectacle around the controversial hanging, shrouded under a thick veil of secrecy, censored by prison walls and carried out ahead of the scheduled date, was subverted, it seems, by a loud noise heard from outside the compound. Not a howl of suffering, but one final shout of defiance, in Kalab Zindabad, the prisoner's last testament, delivered from the stage of the gallows. The prison walls reverberated with the slogan, suggests Gopal Thakur in his, in his retelling. The musician and scholar Madan Gopal Singh recalls a story passed down by his father, the poet Harbhajan Singh, describing the family's ancestral village of Itra on the night of the hanging. Itra was the closest human, uh, or, sorry, Itra was the, the closest habitation to Lahore Central Jail, separated from the complex by a railway shunting line. Like most of the district, the village was agog with excitement on 23rd of March charged with rumors of the impending execution. After the fall of darkness, the tension was broken by distant echoing shouts of in Kalab Sindabad. Groups of villagers gathered on the rooftops in stunned silence before beginning steadily to return the slogan into the night, in Kalab Sindabad, in Kalab Sindabad. Madan Gopal imagines the scene and here I'm quoting from, from him. Their sound is picked up by the inmates of the jail and reciprocated. The atmosphere now becomes fully charged. Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs rise as one primal sound and the night is torn asunder. This impassioned expression of solidarity between the prison mates and the villagers continues till late into the night. Not a lamp is lit anywhere in the vicinity, whereas the distant jail seems to burn like an island of light. That's Madan Gopal Singh. In this telling, the resolve of Bhagat Singh and his comrades in the face of death is contagious. Their final shouts cascade, they spark a rising chorus. This death is not to be greeted with mournful silence. It demands a response, the escalation of a fight. So this final call, this, this call to revolution is suggestive, I think, of how Bhagat Singh um, understood his death as a form of incitement, as the start of a revolution rather than a tragic end, um, a spectacle to stir other Indians out of complacency, to stir them to action. So to honor Bhagat Singh's sacrifice again is not to mourn or to reflect, but to act, to join in a fight. And indeed, Bhagat Singh's death was followed by a spate of attacks on British government officials in India, such that Gandhi, who uh, you will know was the leading nationalist figure of uh, Bhagat Singh's time, saw it fit to denounce the appearance of a quote unquote Bhagat Singh cult in the early 1930s. But I'm interested in how this demand, this call to responsibility, transcends this immediate post-execution period of the 1930s, and in fact continues to resonate today in 21st century uh, India. So I'm interested in Bhagat Singh's afterlife as a disruptive figure, as someone who forces us to recognize and critique the imperfections and inequalities of the present, the unfinished business of anti-colonial revolution. So Bhagat Singh's eventful afterlife uh, is enabled in part because the revolutionary was not just a kind of anti-colonial figure, he was not just a, a kind of straightforward nationalist volunteer, but a revolutionary and a critic of the state. So this is important because it facilitates an ambivalent relationship to that moment of independence in 1947. And this year, this transition from colonial to post-colonial rule is purported to be the end of one historical sequence and the beginning of another. 
But we know, and I'm sure this has also been coming up in the seminar series, we know that this was also a moment of uncertainty, uh, of unfinished business. And there has been debate around uh, the nature of this transformation, transformation, the nature of the freedom that was achieved and a keen awareness that certain inequalities, certain forms of exploitation, certain approaches to, to statecraft, state violence have carried on from the colonial period into the post-colonial politics and society. And this is perhaps, um, uh, for me, most clearly articulated in the early Communist Party of India slogan, Ye Azadi Juti, this freedom is a lie. But such dissatisfaction is not uh, the sole um, province of, of communists of the left. We know that Gandhi was assassinated by uh, Godse, a right-wing Hindu nationalist, because of his dissatisfaction with independence for a different reason, for uh, its relation to the creation of Pakistan. But the point is this, that if 1947 did not establish the future that Bhagat Singh is seen to have fought and died for, then we can say that his call to action, his call to responsibility still has some force. So rather than some irrelevant figure from the past, he remains a sort of comrade, a ghostly comrade in a fight that continues. And this is a situation, as I've, as I've referred to, of unfinished business, of uh, a present stranded halfway to freedom. And I take this notion of being halfway to freedom from a 1980 novel by Rudul Lagarde um, entitled Anitya or The Dispossessed. In Anitya, Garg's protagonist is quite literally haunted by Bhagat Singh. The novel takes place in the decades after independence and the protagonist who had been a student activist um, and indeed had gone to prison uh, under the British is now leading a privileged life in post-colonial India, um, but he is constantly reminded that the caste and class and gender inequalities that compelled him to enter politics as a young man persist, right? So the injunction is, is to say, why not complete what was left half done? Why not complete the revolution that was started? So through this character and his, his kind of hauntings, um, Garg explores the ambiguity of the independence mo moment a moment which he says in an author's preface was not one of triumph, but rather of disillusionment, of angst. The independence, she writes, quote, was nothing more than a transfer of power. At best, we could say we had reached halfway to freedom, or was it halfway to nowhere, unquote. So my book is also an attempt to think about this anxiety over the nature of, of India's freedom. This is a theme that continue, has continued through the post-colonial decades, propelled by a frustration with uh, uh, Indian um, politicians, the Indian nation state, its compromises, and um, the path it has chosen to take, the form it continues to forge. And so there's this kind of lingering question of, uh, is this what our anti-colonial heroes really died for? Is this the future that they wanted? And Bhagat Singh is invited into the present then through this sense of being stuck halfway as part of an attempt to complete what was left half done. So in chapter five of, of, of the book, um, I talk about three different experiences of unfinished business, of being caught halfway. The first is the experience of being caught halfway again, of repetition and relapse. And here I am interested in debates around corruption in India. The second considers the problem of duration, of being halfway still, of fighting for a revolution that is yet to come. And third and finally, the predicament of being halfway always, the kind of trans-historical significance of Bhagat Singh's opposition to tyranny, to tyrants. So halfway again, halfway still, and halfway always. And I want to say a, bit, a little bit about each of these three ideas. Um, as a, as a, to kind of demonstrate um, the, the variety of ways I'm thinking about Bhagat Singh's afterlives, right? And part of the point that I will draw out is that um, although Bhagat Singh uh, in, in his writings is very much um, a kind of uh, leftist figure, he's very much a revolutionary figure, we see that his, his, his afterlife is, is, uh, uh, is kind of active across the political spectrum. So let me say first a little bit about um, 
halfway again, a struggle called halfway again. And by this, I mean the sense that the freedoms won by India's anti-colonial freedom fighters have been spoiled or compromised by the corruption and self-interest of post-colonial uh, elites. If the problems that the young revolutionary faced in 1920s India have returned, that they are repeating, then so must we take seriously the, the, the type of prescription or the type of response he advocated. So this rhetoric of repetition was very common during the large scale anti-corruption protests which dominated Indian politics in 2011 and 12. Um, this was when I was starting doing my research for this book. So it may seem a little um, uh, distant in our memory now, but when I was beginning my, my research into Bhagat Singh's uh, contemporary significance in India, this was during the India Against Corruption um, movement. Um, and these mass mobilizations across the country were uh, based, no, no doubt, on a, a very real problem, right? This kind of um, the bribery and political graft at, at every level, but rather than, um, but, but they might actually be seen as advocating a very sort of um, middle class or status quo response to this problem rather than a revolutionary response in the sense that anti-corruption activists in this period were calling for the kind of internal cleansing of structures, the purging of, of, um, of corrupt figures rather than any wider change in a system that, that has created um, corruption. So Anna Hazare, the leader and, and instigator of the anti-corruption movement was consistently heralded as a Gandhian, right? He famously declared the commencement of a second freedom struggle. This is what I mean by repetition, right? The need to resume the fight for Swaraj. It was Gandhi who provided the model of action for Hazare, the fast to death, the prayer, the ethical regime. But it was the sacrifice of the revolutionary martyrs that Indians were urged to vindicate. It, is, it was the profound commitment of Bhagat Singh and his comrades that had been betrayed by corrupt um, figures in contemporary India, and which would need to be reanimated. So Hazare would even at one point offer a public apology to Bhagat Singh, saying that he was sorry for what we have done with the freedom that you won from us. So the untimely stakes of this fight were something repeatedly affirmed by his young supporters who took up the slogan in Kalab Zindabad at Ramlila Medan. Um, and continually asserted that their sacrifices in fighting corruption paled in comparison to those of Bhagat Singh and his comrades. But if Hazare's methods were ultimately nonviolent, based around public rallies, fasts, offshoots of the movement took the idea of internal corruption uh, in a more militant direction. And one of the groups I was interested in during my field work was uh, the Delhi-based Bhagat Singh Kranti Sena, who rather than, uh, re you know, revolutionary, as Kranti suggests, um, they were an exceptionally reactionary group. And many uh, uh, members um, were tied to different Hindu nationalist youth groups at the time. So the organization's acknowledgement of Bhagat Singh uh, in the present, his, his significance in the presence, was not to supplement a kind of Gandhian notion of self-sacrifice, as we see with Hazare, but about affirming that the second freedom struggle might also demand a militant responsibility, a kind of willingness to break the law, to be vigilantes, um, uh, specifically when it comes to taking care of quote unquote traitors, corrupts, and anti-nationals who prevent Indian national flourishing. So uh, the Bhagat Singh Kranti Sena were particularly active in defending Kashmir as a part of India against those who suggested they should have self-determination um, this was again aligned with uh, our responsibility to protect the territorial integrity of India that Bhagat Singh is seen to have, have died for, right? And so here, Bhagat Singh's demand is turned inward, right? He's, he's rebranded here as a sort of vigilante masculinity, an aggressive sort of um, protection of the nation against internal enemies. And you can see this kind of dramatically in the image on the left-hand side of the slide where he's kind of um, holding this, this, this kind of weapon to enforce um, uh, his authority. And looking at this now, um, the Kranti Sena were not some outlier. And indeed, some of you will know that the group's leader, Tejinder Pal Singh Bhaga, um, has become a quite prominent spokesperson for the BJP in, in Delhi. Um, 
But when I was doing the research, part of why their appearance was interesting to me at least was its resonance with the popular film Rang de Besanti, which many of you will know, which came out a few years before the anti-corruption movement, but could be seen as part of the movement's genealogy, right? And I won't go into detail because I'm sure many of you have, uh, have seen the film, but just to kind of briefly say, we see in the film a group of kind of politically apathetic, party-centric young men um, starting to learn about Bhagat Singh's time and the present. Um, oh, sorry, Start, starting to learn about Bhagat Singh and his comrades, um, their sacrifice, their patriotism, and eventually the, these young men become so incensed by the state of India that they end up killing a corrupt government official, right? And the scenes of the film flicker repeatedly between Bhagat Singh's time and the present such that it appears Bhagat Singh uh, himself makes the decision to kill, not out of bloodlust, but as a matter of justice. And in the final sequence, they die uh, with their revolutionary doppelgangers, they're kind of revolutionary um, figures that they are uh, inspired by, looking down upon them approvingly. And Amir Khan who's playing um, uh, uh, both a kind of figure in the present, but also Chandrasekhar Azad, dies um, together with, with the revolutionary. So this is again one of those ways in which that ordered sequence between past, present, and future is being challenged. So the revolutionaries continue to incite action today. The dead revolutionaries' uh, exhortation to repetition that we see in the first example here um, is contrasted with the second temporal experience I want to talk about, that of being halfway still. And this is consistent more with Mridul Lagarde's uh, novel, which I mentioned earlier, the idea that Bhagat Singh's fight never actually finished, right? That here is a young man who never got to fulfill his potential. And that the best way then to honor his sacrifice is to march forward, to continue his revolutionary fight. There's a famous story of uh, Bhagat Singh reading Lenin's uh, biography on the day of his execution. Right? When the prison guards came to collect him, he had to put down this book unfinished. Right? And you start to see in the 1960s and 1970s, especially um, a kind of common um, uh, statement among student groups on the Indian left that they must pick up this book and carry on where Bhagat Singh left off. And indeed, this figuration of Bhagat Singh is most reliably um, convened within the Indian left student community organizations like um, the All India Students Association, which you see on the screen, but also the Student Federation of India, um, even though they may have been founded in the post-colonial period, actually trace their lineage back to Bhagat Singh's struggle, a shared commitment to a revolution that is still to come. Right? And students may honor Bhagat Singh by carrying his spirit, his revolutionary spirit, into a new age, right? into a new conjuncture. And indeed, uh, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with the kind of frequency of reading groups around the, the revolutionaries' writings on university campuses that not only understand him as a historical figure, but also ask what his, his ideas might tell us about fighting contemporary um, uh, forms of capitalism, market liberalism, neo-colonial exploitation, environmental devastation, these sorts of things, right? So this is about not repeating Bhagat Singh's struggle as we saw in the first example, but about adapting, right? Of, of updating that revolutionary struggle for the present. And more than this, Bhagat Singh's uh, sensitivity to figures like Lenin, but also to a global terrain of revolution from, from Ireland to, to, um, to Italy, to, um, uh, to Turkey, um, is seen as an incitement for young uh, uh, students to escape the more parochial concerns of nationalism. And indeed, during my time, um, uh, you know, um, uh, completing this research, um, there was a, a desire to connect um, this way of thinking about India's revolutionary history um, in, in relation to new uh, experiments like at the time the Occupy movement, the Arab Spring, thinking about how revolutionary politics might be updated for the 21st century. 
So I'll just move on now then to my final example, which is this impression of being caught halfway always. So I've talked about halfway again, halfway still, this kind of idea that a revolution still needs to take place. And then the last one being halfway always. And this relates to the idea that Bhagat Singh's example of how to stand defiantly in the face of power is uh, of a sort of wider trans historical significance, by which I mean he speaks to a sort of kind of need for a constant uh, a sense of uh, vigilante, constant vigilance with relation to the present. Um, it's, it's understood that there will always be tyrants and so there must always be rebels. And this is a discourse that I encountered most readily in Punjab. And Bhagat Singh's enduring popularity um, in Punjab specifically and among Sikhs in particular is enabled precisely because his life and death align so well with established narratives of heroism, of honorable action in the region. Bhagat Singh is often referred to as a buggy, right? A rebel, a popular trope uh, in, in kind of local folklore, regional folklore, who cannot help but confront exploitation in all that guise, guises. So as a buggy, Bhagat Singh is incorporated into a heroic dissident pantheon curated through centuries of Sikh struggle against Mughal, British, and then the Indian state rulers. And there is this kind of idea that um, uh, uh, kind of a Sikh can only be a king or a buggy. That is, if the Sikh male, specifically, and this is highly gendered, cannot rule, then he is bound to fight those who do rule. There is no middle path between uh, these ways of controlling one's own destiny, and each is perpetually kind of under threat from the other. And these folk traditions serve an authorizing function in politics. And indeed, Bhagat Singh was con commonly referenced during the 1980s Punjab insurgency when uh, militants agitated against the Indian state for an independent Khalistan, right, a homeland for Sikhs. And this was an extremely bloody struggle. But on this terrain, Bhagat Singh was seen to demand action in consonance with a heroic tradition. Right? He was upheld not as an Indian, uh, not as a leftist revolutionary, not as an Indian patriot, but as a product of Punjabi soil and indeed of a kind of Sikh upbringing that needed to be protected. So there's lots of examples around this, but let me point out just one. Um, in 1986, two Khalistani militants, Harjinder Singh Jinda and Sukhdev Singh Sukha, assassinated the Indian general A.S. Vedya in Pune. Vedya was the former chief of army staff who was responsible for the Golden Temple Offensive in 1984. And before they were hanged, Sukha and Jinda released a statement claiming that they had been following, and I quote, the same battlefield strategy that was once used by our hero martyr Bhagat Singh. Right? The same battlefield strategy that was once used by our hero martyr Bhagat Singh. In performing this task, they wrote, we have reminded you that our heroes are shadowing your tyrants. Our heroes are shadowing your tyrants. So in the book, I explore this kind of, um, uh, th this discourse around um, Bhagat Singh's uh, significance amongst this movement. But I also, um, I'm interested, and I'll just mention this briefly, um, how over the last decade, Bhagat Singh, as, as a buggy figure, has taken a kind of less politicized turn in Punjabi youth culture in terms of his celebration by popular musicians. Um, and there has been a phenomenon uh, of prominent singers in the early 2010s, um, people like Yo-Yo Honey Singh or Jazzy B, Diljit Dosanjh, who you see here, taking a break from their kind of usual songs, which are about, um, you know, partying or, or romance, these kind of things, to sing a more uh, serious song about Bhagat Singh, uh, during which they usually wear black and play with a militant aesthetic, as you see here with the, the noose, right? and, and also the kind, of, um, uh, the kind of assembly of men. Um, Jazzy B's video, uh, which was about, um, uh, uh, that which referenced Bhagat Singh, was particularly controversial due to his alignment of Bhagat Singh with Bindran Mala. Right uh, within this category of buggy. 
So the unfinished business represented by Bhagat Singh here in a sort of spectralized form authorizes an everyday hard-nosed ethic of masculine performance, a sort of everyday proving oneself. So much is made of the fact that Bhagat Singh was born into a Jatsi family, that he embodies these masculine virtues of bravery, of honor, of self-sufficiency. This image can be easily commodified. Right? So I'm just going to move now to uh, conclusion. So these three experiences of a present caught halfway, I hope, give you some uh, indication of the breadth of Bhagat Singh's appeal that I've been trying to explore in, in my book. They relate to very different political projects, and the object of my research is not to prove that these are kind of uh, commensurable, that they are the same. Um, they are very different ways of negotiating a revolutionary inheritance. But I am interested in the specificity of Bhagat Singh as an agitator in politics. So his heroic gestures, his self-sacrifice might exceed precise ideological meaning, right? But its effects are not completely unbound. Because if in life and death, Bhagat Singh stands demonstrative of a particular way of being in and towards uh, a political presence, the value of courage, of commitment, and capacity for action. The revolutionary's promise is interpreted again through highly individuated practices and not through uh, questions of law, of institutions, or even a precise program. There is a kind of recurring idea of individual action, of individual um, uh, courage that goes through these uh, aftermaths. Hence his appeal across the political spectrum, his ability to evade association with one particular party, one particular uh, organization or movement. So one point to emphasize in conclusion is that revolutionary figures like Bhagat Singh are treated here not as kind of um, burdens on the present, but as figures of clarification, of illumination, of, uh, of, of helping us among the living to identify what needs to be done in the present. And this is why it is possible for us to ask, what does Bhagat Singh want? Action, I've argued, provides the primary form of responsibility to the, to, to the um, dead revolutionary. And Bhagat Singh's revolutionary inheritance is about resisting complacency, about refusing complicity in injustice, of constantly interrogating the present. And this is the call, again, of uh, in Kalab Zindabad, long live revolution, that kind of infinite demand that I uh, alluded to in the, the talk's title. Battles over history are, of course, battles over the present. Um, the German theorist and philosopher Walter Benjamin famously wrote about the historian who can fan the spark of hope in the past. That is, in the history of previous struggles, we can find inspiration for our struggles in the present. But for Benjamin, the historian must recognize that, quote, even the dead will not be safe from the enemy if he wins. Even the dead will not be safe from the enemy if he wins. And this is a serious warning that is worth thinking about in the context of a global shift towards right wing politics, which involves as a central part of its platform, the rewriting of history in a variety of contexts uh, in India, but also here in my own context of the United Kingdom, in which um, there has been no real reckoning with the damage um, of empire um, and, and Britain's complicity in, in, in the history of violence and ex exploitation. But speaking of India and the enduring power of anti-colonial histories today, I would like to invert Benjamin's warning to say that even the enemy, if he wins, will not be safe from the dead. Even the enemy, if he wins, will not be safe from the dead. This is the lesson that figures like Bhagat Singh present to us. Escaping these strategies of containment, they attempt, that attempt to exercise their radical potential. They continue to haunt today's politics to remind us that things can or should be different. So what does it mean then to celebrate or commemorate or conjure Bhagat Singh in 21st century India? If Bhagat Singh calls on us to recognize the many, that many of the inequalities and injustices he fought in 1920s 
continue today and in many ways have sharpened or transformed, then how do we respond? Do we evade his call? Do we affirm it? Do we escalate it? And I think I'll, I'll, I'll finish there um, in part because I would love to hear um, some of the thoughts of the audience on these very questions um, and to um, get your own feelings about how this concept of afterlives, of the kind of long-term legacies of the anti-colonial movement in India today um, help can help us understand the nature of politics in the present. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Chris. Uh, now, through this informative journey into the both past and present uh, in this paper, so many things are, of course, uh, individually relatable because we have been living through this contemporary history. And uh, Bhagat Singh has been as much of the past as of our present and the projection of future in South Asia for many of us. So now uh, this presentation is open for uh, comment and uh, question, any suggestions from all of you. So you can now uh, raise your hand and come in to make any comment, suggestions or question. Yes, Arun. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, this is a very interesting presentation. Thank you for that. So I just like got curious when you talk about afterlife of Bhagat Singh in India. I just want to know how Bhagat Singh is imagined in England. Because the idea of Gandhi that he like just like how Hinduism becomes synonymous to India, like modern Indian history or Indian freedom movement becomes synonymous with Gandhi actually. So he represented a very different uh, a, a, a move, a strategical movement, like non-violence. But so like in, every throughout the world, it, India become the country of Gandhi. So but the Bhagat Singh and other extremist revolutionary terrorists, they carried out attacks on the Englishmen straight away either to guns or bombs or somehow they attacked the Englishmen, including Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose, Kuchiram Bose. We had a very a huge list of it. So how these revolutionary terrorists, including Bhagat Singh, they are uh, like they, they, they are viewed by the Englishmen in England, be it in academia or like common folks. How do they see these people? Because they are very different from Gandhi. Gandhi become like acceptable, non-violence. So, but how are these people are viewed there? That I wanted to know. Shall I answer it, Tirash? Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you, Aaron, for uh, a really interesting question. Um, so, Bhagat Singh is not very well known in, um, in, in the UK. And this has to do in part because um, kind of what I was suggesting about the way that England has not faced up to its imperial history. Right. England likes to believe that the um, decolonization was a smooth, nonviolent process that England gifted independence to um, different groups. Right. Um, uh, different, sorry, different countries that it was kind of a, a, a sort of um, part of that sort of imperial project of installing democracy and in institutions, etc. Right. So there is a thus a kind of denial or a, a resistance to confront the, the, the prominence of revolutionary and violent movements in anti-colonial struggles. This is not just about India. Um, this is also about how uh, very violent episodes in places like Kenya or um, with the Mau Mau Rebellion or uh, Malaya, the Malayan emergency are, are, are kind of repressed or not really talked about in England. Um, so in that sense, what you're saying about India's association with Gandhi, um, it, it, it suits that narrative, right? And there is a statue of Gandhi outside of the Houses of Parliament um, in, in London. So, so people would not typically know 
Bhagat Singh, yeah, or, or even Subhash Chandra Bose, these sorts of figures, um, uh, uh, it would not be known very widely. It would be known uh, among the diaspora, right? Um, and indeed, I'm so I'm I, I work in in London. I'm from Canada, and I first came across Bhagat Singh in Canada because of the efforts of local um, uh, Indian communities there to commemorate this figure. Um, and it's similar here, you know, there's, there are Bhagat Singh Memorial lectures that are run at universities in, in London and so on. But it is very much a kind of minority um, uh, concern. Um, this is not to say, you know, if we look back at the history of this event, we know that when Bhagat Singh was in prison, um, that there were many left-wing groups in England who expressed solidarity with with um, Bhagat Singh as a political prisoner. We know that money was raised for appeals, and um, we also know that 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 kind of news was shared. Um, but in terms of a general consciousness, which is what I think you're asking around Bhagat Singh in England today, I would say it's very uh, minimal for the reasons I've said. Does that answer your question, Aaron? Yes, it did. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, next. History Society, yeah. You guys? Oh, sorry. Uh, I didn't realize that I'm talk working from the other account, but nevertheless, uh, no, I just, uh, Chris, thank you for this interesting talk. I was just wondering. Uh, uh, is there a way also to think about, because I think your choice of Bhagat Singh representation um, is, is to the contour of the political. In fact, I looked upon it from uh, the examples that you shared were predominantly from the contour of the political. If you look at some of the images from the cultural point of view, uh, how would you then address this particular uh, issue? Uh, do, did you come across? Uh, I'm aware of one of the work. I'm sure you are also familiar with the work of, say, for instance, Ishwar Dayal Gaur, who looks at his representation as a bridegroom. Uh, so when you uh, bring in the cultural symbols, what kind of afterlives then Bharat Singh lives? Yeah. Um... I, uh, Ishwar Dal Gore's book is 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 a wonderful um, text, and I would really recommend it to people. And he has that expertise as a literary scholar um, of Punjabi literature to to engage with that. I I came at it as as you say through an interest in the history of political thought. I'm trained as an intellectual historian, and so I was very much um, in, engaged in um, thinking about why how we understand what I describe as the kind of political argument or the political dispute of contemporary India and what role um, figures from the anti-colonial period continue to play in that, right? Now, that part of that is a very kind of uh, practical, pragmatic um, uh, issue. So, uh, in Punjabi, I don't, I don't have the expertise in Punjabi to be able to do that deep kind of um, uh, research, if that makes sense, Yogesh. And I didn't want to kind of, um, uh, I, I wanted to do it justice if I was, if I was going to do it. So um, I constrain my focus to thinking about why Bhagat Singh is still seen as someone who is uh, able to incite politics rather than um, uh, necessarily just thinking about culture. Although you're right that it is a very, it, it can, um, give us a very different image of uh, Bhagat Singh as a sentimental figure, as this figure of the bridegroom, as, a, as um, uh, someone who, who compels a sense of, of intimacy that I would say um, also supports some of the, the, the kind of seriousness which was, with which his, his inheritance is, is understood. And that's probably an inadequate response, but if you want to say anything else, you'll be No, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, there is a colleague from Delhi University, Pratik. Uh, he has written a question in chat box. Uh, Chris, can you see that in the chat box? Yes, I'll, I'll read it out so people uh, are aware. So Pratik has answered or has asked, while engaging with the afterlife of Bhagat Singh, 
I could not help but draw parallels to how Che Guevara had the same post-death fate during his mainstreaming in punk culture. A similar parallel can be drawn how Ambedkar is being mainstreamed in today's post-colonial India. The argument being that isn't afterlife mainstreaming more of a ruling class method to negotiate with subaltern or marginalized distress in order to maintain a status quo. So um, thank you, Pratik, for uh, raising two parallels, which I am also interested in. I think um, the the connection with Te Guevara is one that's very much um, uh, very frequently raised and how, uh, again, in the, the sort of the last part of my point, uh, the last part of my um, paper around um, Bhangra and the commodification of Bhagat Singh as this rebel figure who is also fits this kind of swaggering masculine uh, formation, right? It probably relates to what you're talking about in terms of Che being mainstreamed in, 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 in uh, maybe via punk culture rather than in punk culture, but in popular culture more generally, right? That we see his face on t-shirts and people may not even know who he is, these kind of things, right? And there is a concern that um, amongst many historians that Bhagat Singh's um, ideas are just not um, understood, right? And this is a very, uh, this is why so many um, excellent scholars have devoted a lot of uh, efforts to making his writings available, of, of speaking about his, his, his ideas. Um, and Bedker, similarly, uh, I, I would love to hear people's thoughts on this because this is not, um, uh, I, I know this is a very kind of active, um, uh, you know, issue in, in contemporary India and the way that Ambedkar is, um, is being, uh, uh, you know, appealed to by different groups um, and um, whether or not that does have uh, consequences for how a sort of properly subaltern or marginalized uh, politics is, is um, counteracted. But one thing that I wanted to say and just in general response to your question is that, yes, there is uh, a way of understanding afterlives as um, a ruling class strategy or, or as being met with a ruling class strategy. And one of the ways that I distinguish this in my book is, is like this. So I have uh, established, as I did in my paper here today, that there is a sense of responsibility to Bhagat Singh, right? There's a sense that he is uh, continuing to make a demand on politics in the present. Now, this demand can be met in two ways. It can be met by a strategy of containment, right? Uh, or a strategy of escalation. This is how I talk about it in the book, containment or escalation. And with containment is exactly what you are talking about here. This idea that Bhagat Singh is not actually, his demand is not relevant right that he is a figure from the past that he can be celebrated that he can be commemorated but ultimately his ideas are no longer relevant and this i think is how uh ruling groups in india have um have have, have treated him this is how i in my book understand statues of bhagat singh i see that statues which are usually taken to mean the kind of uh, usually taken to indicate the kind of widespread popularity of a figure, I see here as actually containing uh, Bhagat Singh as a figure who stands on a pedestal rather than someone who is a comrade in a struggle, right? But containment is only one response to Bhagat Singh's um, inheritance. The other is escalation. The other is the idea of taking seriously the questions Bhagat Singh raised and applying those to political action in the present, right? And for in that sense, I think that he can still be disruptive of a status quo, right? I still think he can still be disruptive of, um, uh, of the kind of what is seen as sensible in a political present. So I think that, um, uh, Pratik, if you want to come on and, and feed back to that, I think you're, you are absolutely right in your comment, but I think that there is another side of that, which is that afterlives are not simply about containment. There is also that path of escalation. Uh, thanks, uh, Chris. In fact, uh, uh, it doesn't look like that the ruling class in India tried to uh, appropriate Bhagat Singh, unlike uh, he, the approach to Ambedkar, uh, for that matter. Um, to Ambedkar in last uh, 20, 30, 20 years in particular, all ruling classes across uh, uh, 
the two broad mainstreams you what we call in india united progressive alliance that is led by congress or nda led by bjp all of them tried to now integrate ambedkar in their pantheon of uh, fi uh, inspiring figures or relatable figures but bhagat singh is not so more that's why bhagat singh day is not a holiday in india still nor uh, any such national state commemoration is done so in that sense it is ruling class is still uh, a state the state to better to say the state is still uncomfortable with bhagat singh to appropriate so that uh, is not a case uh, unlike ambedkar and several other figures uh, but i have uh, there is one more question uh, in your chat box uh, that's by prakash chandra can you see chris yes so yeah. um prakash has, has asked um so kama mclean who is um a, a wonderful historian of, of this revolutionary period um in interwar india kama has said that the male members of hsra were seeing their female members in a familial context such as durga babi sushila devi as sushila d d d um so what do you think about this and please put your views yeah um i think kama's work is is uh you know, pathbreaking in uh, in this regard, and especially her her, her writing on Durga Babi um, as this kind of um, uh, presence uh, of uh, a woman within the Hindustan Socialist Republican Association, um, and the way really critiquing the way that um, Bhagat Singh and others are remembered in these kind of um, very heroic masculine terms, and thinking again about how um women played a role in the revolutionary movement how they also faced certain challenges um how they were kind of framed again maybe in, in a sort of paternalistic familial way um but uh yeah because um so the way that i kind of think the comma comma's book and my book work quite well together in the sense that comma has has uh, really done some extraordinary archival research she's thought about uh the kind of way in which um, the revolutionaries were understood in their context, the influence they had on on, on the mainstream Congress movement. Um, my focus has been kind of after the fact, as you've seen from my talk, uh, focusing maybe more on the post-colonial period. The books complement each other in that way. Um, but I think one of the striking aspects of the afterlife element of Bhagat Singh has been, well, one, as I said, the kind of the 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 desire to see Bhagat Singh as a kind of exceptional individual, right? We have statues of Bhagat Singh rather than Bhagat Singh and his comrades, right? Um, that that see Bhagat Singh as, as not part of this kind of revolutionary collective in the same way. Um, and second, the kind of the, the silencing or the lack of memory about women's role in, in the revolutionary movement. So, um, so I think that is again about how we think about memory, about how how history reflects a lot of um, the uh, you know norms around gender and, and discrimination against certain uh, um, uh, kind of uh, yeah I mean, discrimination against women in, in how um, histories are remembered. So I think as historians, we are very um, responsible for challenging that. Kam has done some amazing work on that. Prakash, does that answer your question? Um, Thanks. Uh, uh, before I ask two questions, any other yeah. member in this uh, group? Ishika Makan, yes. Hello, sir. Uh, yes, sir, Ishika. Ishika. Yes, sir. This is Ishika Makan, and I'm a student of uh, Adam Baker University, Delhi, and I'm doing a bachelor's in history. Uh, my question to you, sir, is that uh, you said that this historical process is halfway. Uh, like it's already half means that the national movement have had an impact on achieving the freedom. So what would you uh, define the other half as not being achieved or something else like it is infinite or the impact of Bhagat Singh would appear when there is a political unrest as a stimulus? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ashika. Um So, I mean, there's different ways of thinking about it, right? Um, and maybe the best to to kind of explain are are related to what I've said. So 
if so halfway as you rightly suggest um suggest that something has been done right so we moved halfway so what's the other half well for some people the other half is a proper political and social revolution right and according to um uh bucket singh's writings we know that this uh, is seen to involve um the kind of uh um, a, a dictatorship of the proletariat, of the kind of um, the end of inequality, um, the end of exploitation of man by man, as he writes. Um, so we know that in one visioning of that idea of halfway to freedom, the other half is uh, a revolutionary change in, in society, which um, many would argue was not accomplished in with 1947, right? As Radu Lagarde writes, it was a transfer of power rather than a revolutionary change, right? And that's, again, a topic for historians to, to debate. And I know that that's what's being explored with this, um, this seminar series. The other way of thinking about it is that question of relapse or repetition, right? So, and this relates to that first example I gave where freedom was won. So the, the kind of, the, the full struggle was, was completed but those freedoms have been uh, have been eroded or have been corrupted since independence, right? This idea that there was, in 1947, this promise of a new type of living, a new co country, a new society, but because of corrupt politicians, of corrupt industrialists, of whatever uh, you imagine it to be, those kind of, that struggle has returned to the way it was in Bhagat Singh's time. So that's the other side of halfway in two different senses. Does that make sense? I know it's it's maybe a little clumsy phrasing on my part, but I was trying to appeal to that Radu Lagarde um, uh, book, which I would again highly recommend. I hope that answers you, Ashika. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Uh, any other participant, Pratap? Uh, thank you so much, sir, for this talk. Uh, I had one question, and that was regarding how did uh, Bhagat Singh's colleagues uh, contribute to his legacy? Because as we know from his articles which he published, Bhagat Singh was quite a complex and forward-thinking fellow who tackled issues like communalism and untouchability, which could be considered to be uh, controversial back then, considering there were several revolutionaries on the Indian side who supported such uh, topics. But um, so did the uh, did uh, Bhagat Singh's uh, comrades or uh, from the Hindu uh, Socialist Republican Association or any of his friends contribute to his legacy after his death? And if they did, did they do so in a manner which was accurate to who he actually was? Or did they also over glorify him in a way? Yeah. Um... Thank you, Pratap, for another interesting question. I, I mean, it's so there's maybe two ways of thinking about it. Um, one is the role of his family in how he has been remembered. And one is the, the role of his, his, his comrades, as, as you kind of asked about. Right? And now Bhagat Singh was, uh, was executed at the end of uh, the Lahore conspiracy case, which was um, a massive case against the Hindustan Socialist Republican Association. And um, many of his comrades after, the, they, they weren't executed, that was just Bhagat Singh, Sukhdev and Raj Guru, but they were sent to prison, many of them to the end of it, right? And we know that many um, uh, prominent figures from the HSRA later joined the Communist Party of India, right? This, this is um, Ajay Ghosh, who was a, was a kind of a general secretary of the CPI, was, um, was a member of the HSRA. And many of them wrote uh, memoirs or uh, biographies of Bhagat Singh, right? And many of them then uh, made the argument that Bhagat Singh was uh, on his way to becoming a communist, right? That he wasn't yet a communist, but he would have become a Piet Lins, right? And this is kind of... A speculation that is recurring in a lot of the biographies written about Bhagat Singh. So this, uh, these books um, and these kind of articles did have an effect on how uh, Bhagat Singh was understood, um, especially because at the time of his life there was a kind of 
often a, um, a debate between Bhagatsing and his group and, and the Communist Party because they were seen as having very different techniques or strategies. Right? Now, um, the other side uh, that I mentioned is Bhagatsing's family. Um, who were able to who were, were critical really in um in distributing and recovering protecting his writings right so uh after partition uh his family moved to Qatar Kalan so we know that um Bhagat Singh was born outside of Lialpur which is today's Faisalabad in, in Pakistan um and he his family moved to Qatar Kalan and um in, in East Punjab um, at Partition. They established a kind of community hall there in, in honor of Bhagat Singh. Uh, his nephew, Jagmohan Singh, was one of the earliest uh, figures to publish um, some of his writings, um, many of which were had been smuggled out of, of prison, right? Um, this includes that uh, very famous essay, Why I'm an Atheist, um, which was printed shortly after his death on the kind of uh, initiative of his father. So um, they have been part of this kind of idea that Bhagat Singh needs to be understood for his for his ideas as well. Um, and to this day, there is a kind of commemoration of Bhagat Singh each year at Kathar Kalan um, uh, at, uh, on the 23rd of March, um, which, you know, many politicians do come to to pay their respects. Um, but uh, is also kind of uh, a way for the family to to continue to um, to honor Bhagat Singh's memory. I hope that answers your question, Bhattam. Yeah, thanks. Uh, any other participant? Okay, so Chris, uh, oh. Ashray, yes, please go. Good afternoon, sir. I am Ashray Goswami from- Can Tech you be loud? We can you be loud, Ashley? Yeah. Good afternoon, sir. I am Ashley Goswami, yeah. second year BA History Honors student from Ambedkar University, Delhi. So my question is that we say that we generally know. Actually, I noticed that uh, along with Bhagat Singh, there were two other comrades, Sukhdev and Rajguru, which were who were hanged due to the bombing incident, but they are not as celebrated as Bhagat Singh. So I just want, I was just curious that what are the reasons, if there are any for this? Yeah, um, it's a good question and not one that I have um, a kind of definitive answer for. I think Bhagat Singh um, became a sort of uh, during the trial, he became kind of a uh, leader figure, right? And he was he was the one who was associated with the bombing. Um, he had this very, I mean, some historians or some scholars, one of whom um, is is Christopher Pinney, but also um, Colin McLean has written on this, is how how powerful that image, which I open my um, presentation with of Bhagat Singh in a trilby hat with his mustache looking at the camera how powerful that image was in building a kind of um sort of symbolic significance of this figure right so that he had this kind of charismatic image which people really um uh latched onto he was also kind of uh yeah as I said very much seen as a kind of spokesperson for the group he was uh defending himself in the trial so he got a lot of um, um, press for that. Um, but in terms of why figures like Sukhdev and Rajguru um, are, are less kind of well-known or less well-celebrated, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, we know that we have a lot more writings by Bhagat Singh than by these figures, so that might be part of it. But I do think there is something about that image, which Christopher Pinney argues is actually evocative of Bhagat Singh's modernity. Right, his kind of um, his ability to um, uh, to represent a certain vision of of, uh, of, of an Indian revolutionary um, that stands in contrast to a figure like Gandhi. Right, so contrasting with Gandhi, 
as someone in traditional dress who's old, um, who's kind of more fragile looking uh, versus someone like Bhagat Singh, this kind of I kind of youth of modernity of kind of um, uh, of potential. So there is a lot to be said here about the, the use of some of these posters like that I showed where with Bhagat Singh giving his head to Mother India um, and, and how all of these contribute to create uh, a, a sort of yeah popular um, um, afterlife for these figures. And again, as Yogesh mentioned, there's also this kind of folklore, folkloric um, quality to Bhagat Singh's life and, and death that is um, uh, seized upon. So I don't really have a direct answer for you, uh, Ashray, but um, but this this would be my feeling. Yeah, thanks. A lot to do with his writing and being this, being the very uh, articulate and uh, sharp spokesperson of the revolutionary thoughts of the time. In fact, uh, <clears throat> when in the young age of the co uh, uh, college student, we read them, it looks so uh, advanced of the of the time. And so, con uh, so relevant even the, even in the contemporary uh, time, whether the, especially his writing on untouchability and the resolution to the problem of untouchability, which was not so much talked about by the uh, freedom fighters in the twenties and for mm. for several decades even afterwards, and the question of scientific temperament on atheism uh, that was again so advanced of its time. So anyway, thanks. Uh, any other uh, member here? Any other uh, student, colleague? Any more question? If not, uh, I do have two uh, quick uh, co uh, comment and question. Uh, one, uh, your formulation of uh, halfway is still halfway again and halfway always, and three, uh, ways of uh, contemporary <clears throat> uh, contemporary uh, let's say uh, invocation of bhagat singh one in uh, uh, in a conservative ways uh, uh, the second uh, by the leftist group uh, for secular uh, socialist politics and third in uh, in in a masculine uh, uh, image of resistance defiance uh, in uh, in many popular groups especially in punjab do you think that uh, uh, these three ways of uh, invoking bhagat singh in contemporary time uh, are not just three ways but uh, uh, sorry not just uh, three uh, political forms uh, but uh, three uh, ideological, political uh, projection through Bhagat Singh. And uh, in doing so, have you come across uh, uh, discussion in uh, contemporary India on with, to what extent they are uh, missing what actually Bhagat Singh represented in his own time? and how they are distorting or how they are, uh, uh, let's say, imaginatively uh, taking Bhagat Singh's legacy forward. Have you come across discussion on uh, this uh, yeah. possible distortion or possible imaginative uh, forward projection of Bhagat Singh's legacy? That's the one that you can comment on. And the second is around method. Uh, your uh, presentation reminds us uh, some of the very uh, insightful works recently done along the same method for instance uh, you may you may be aware of romila thapar's work on somnath that how the somnath temple is uh, over the century uh, differently uh, uh, received consumed and uh, uh, and uh, uh, varied perceptions built around it varied discourses built around it that means in a way the afterlife of somnath uh, over the centuries similarly there is an insightful methodological work done by Sabhasachi Bhattacharya, the biography of Bande Matram, a song, where mm -hmm. once again, uh, the varied way of uh, relating to Bande Matram and the diverse discourses built around uh, the place of Bande Matram over the 20th century, 
uh, has been mapped by uh, Sabasachi Bhattacharya. So, in the beginning, you had said that uh, this uh, the afterlife of Bhagat Singh is methodologically not the history of, uh, uh, let's say, perception or consumptionist history. Consumptionist history, not the history of material consumption, but public history, mm -hmm. consuming the past for public uh, for contemporary uh, public life. So if you uh, compare with those uh, methodological uh, exercises that are done by some of the historians, uh, can you say that you are uh, either continuing the same method or you are uh, developing that method uh, to do this kind of research in one or other way? So these are my two observations. Mm -hmm. Can you comment on that? Yeah, thank you for some really insightful comments. Um, so I, I, in fact, my response is kind of related in the sense that, um, okay, so first on the question of, of distortion, um, one of the things that I was trying to think about with this work was there is most of the literature on Bhagasing takes the form that, that you mentioned, which is that um, Bhagat Singh is seen as this Indian youthful patriot. People don't understand his ideas. So let's, um, this is a distortion of his ideas. So let's kind of recover his ideas and, and see how um, uh, how we should understand this figure, right? And again, I think that that is like classic, strong, important historical work, right? But one of the things that I was interested in is how often that, you know, telling someone that they are misunderstanding Bhagat Singh doesn't necessarily allow them to um, reformulate their their understanding, right? So we can hope that you will show someone the evidence, that we will show someone why I'm an atheist as an, an essay and say, this is what Bhagat Singh thought and believed. But it became very clear during my research that people had very different relationships to Bhagat Singh, but he was seen as very important to them. And this was not necessarily connected to his writings, right? And so there's, um, you might know this Anand Padwarden um, documentary on Bhagat Singh, where he's going, or it's called In Memory of Friends. And it's it's actually set during the kind of ins Punjab insurgency. And Anand Padwarden is going around and he's interviewing different people about how they understand Bhagat Singh. And he's saying to them, look, he wrote this. And they're saying, no, he didn't. That's not that's not my my bucket saying, you know, like there's a kind of limit to what we as historians can actually um, do to win people over. Right. So part of what I wanted to, to to do with this project was not to deny that there is distortion of bucket saying. And clearly he is being, um, you know, misunderstood in different ways um, or aspects of his history are being uh, avoided. Um, but to recognize that that doesn't mean that um, he's still, that, that this is purely kind of um, uh, a sort of willful appropriation, to kind of recognize that he still means a lot to people, even in this distorted way, right? So I don't know if I'm, that makes complete sense, um, but I, I didn't want to say you're wrong in your way of understanding Bhagat Singh. I wanted to say, why do you understand Bhagat Singh in this way? Or why is he important to you in this way, right? In, in terms of when I was speaking to people, say on the Hindu right or um, in, involved in different kind of um, Punjabi cultural politics um, during my research. Um, and this relates then to the, your question about method, which is um, uh, uh, again, very insightful one. And um, Ramana Dapar's uh, book on Somnath is something that I really um, admire. Uh, I know Sabya Sachi Bhattacharya's work very well, but I didn't actually know about this um, Bande Mataram uh, essay, so I'll definitely read that with interest. But I guess um, one of the ways that I try and distinguish my work from what I, what I talked about is kind of reception history, right? The way in which history is received is to kind of challenge that notion of us in the present as being in full control of how we understand history, right? So that was the, the, the way that I see my work in relation to reception history is to think about haunting, which is where the past actually 
um, you know, has an impact on how we understand the present, right? So um, to recognize that Bhagat Singh is not someone that can just be appropriated, but that Bhagat Singh actually has an impact on you, that Bhagat Singh can change your way of thinking about the present. Um, it's not just about how you use Bhagat Singh, right? So it's kind of moving away again from this idea of use and abuse reception to think about haunting and the way in which we are held hostage sometimes to figures from the, the past. Does that, does that make sense, Dheeraj? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, uh, this, you can take these two uh, co comment, th two observations made in the chat box yeah. as the last one, then we will uh, wind up. One is by Prakash Chandra, second is by Hardik. Um, so Prakash is curious to know about the story of the book's cover picture of Bhagat Singh. Um, why have why have I covered his face and what's the significance? Again, it's it's partially that um, the idea that Bhagat Singh becomes a sort of uh, blank canvas for people to 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 kind of explore different ideas of politics on, right? So I was trying to again challenge that idea that um, Bhagat Singh can be kind of uh, known in that kind of historicist manner as this stable historical figure, and again think of him as a spectral or ghostly figure who takes different forms based on which political context he's being used in. So it's kind of a poetic engagement with that. I know some people, I've had some friends tell me that it seems like an insult to Bhagat Singh to cover his face. And I hope it's not read that way, but it is, it is instead seen as a way to kind of honor that theme of the book, which is about um, how Bhagat Singh um, is, is, is seen differently by different people. Right? And in response to Hardik's, a uh, question about the fading popularity of extremists in the post-independence era versus moderates. Um, in fact, Hardik, I, I would say that um, I don't know if I, I see it that way. I think that, in fact, the popularity of a figure like Bhagat Singh has, uh, has been very stable and, um, uh, in, in fact, in certain circumstances, risen in post-colonial since independence, precisely because, as I said, he is seen as still, his ideas are still seen to be relevant, right? And as Dhiraj mentioned, they, there is a sense in, in his writings that he, he, he had a kind of very advanced understanding of a lot of um, uh, problems facing post-independence India, right? So I don't know if there is a, in fact, I think there's probably been more frustration with more moderate figures since independence, but that's, that's just my impression and others may disagree. I don't know what you think about that, Dheeraj. But... I'm sorry, actually, uh, my connection had fluctuated. Oh, that's so okay. Last two minutes I lost, so I can't. That's uh, okay. Yeah. No uh, problem. Yeah. I, I think I've said what I need yeah. to say. Yeah. So uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for joining uh, today uh, on this event organized by History Society. And uh, on behalf of History Society, of course, uh, some member will come to uh, present the vote of thanks. So now I can invite Ashray, you want to present the vote of thanks? Yes, sir. Yeah. So I would, first of all, I would like to thank our honorable speaker, Dr. Chris Moffat, to accept our invitation Respectable, respectable Chair Dr. Dheeraj Kumar Knight to moderate the lecture. Our program coordinators, Dr. Yogesh Sahani and Professor Tanuja Kothyal, for, for their support and worthy suggestion, and all scholars and students who joined us today. I personally like it, this lecture actually gives me some insights into the way we, way we think about Bhagat Singh and how there are different view, point of views through which we can see his personality. His And I definitely agree that there are, there, among the masses, there are things people don't actually know about his ideas and they are just they are just what to say 
going with the flow of popular perception i would say and i hope all of you enjoyed the lecture and will take away some good thoughts from it thank you uh, thanks asray uh, thanks uh, uh, members of history society and other program coordinators uh, coordinating this event uh, yes uh, it has been uh, quite enriching interaction with uh, chris and we look forward to uh, other occasions of uh, more such engagement uh, both on online platform and whenever possibility arises then face to face at aud and other places possibly we can approach you sometime uh, to become a discussant or chair in the conference organized by history society in the coming months uh, so uh, thank uh, it has uh, of course uh, so much uh, new thing uh, especially to uh, one of the sub disciplines emerging and we are trying to integrate in our program that is public history so what chris has contributed today is one way of doing public history and uh, uh, this is one uh, uh, area that uh, we need to uh, develop and uh, integrate with our program at ambedkar university delhi as well and this is i think uh, one uh, emerging uh, sub discipline within historical studies which uh, we may give a new lease of life to historical studies actually uh, because uh, the the presence of past in uh, the public uh, discussion in public memory in uh, in estimation of some of the things done in the present in projection of future uh, are very fundamentally uh, around fundamental component of our daily life and which is more uh, uh, powerful uh, than the so called correct understanding of the past in itself and it requires very uh, thorough scrut scrutiny and uh, critical engagement with what uh, chris has presented the one method that is the reception of past within uh, done in the public history and the second what he is uh, uh, presenting uh, bringing uh, about uh, is uh, the the uh, projection of present and future in an imaginative and creative way uh, with reference to or by by invoking the uh, the some of the movements of past some of the characters of the past so it's not just the reception but it is creative and imaginative way of engaging with that uh, past to project uh, to build our present and project uh, and uh, future so we need to uh, work on this uh, some of the important takeaways from today's discussion and uh, we are surely uh, thankful for your presence chris and all of you who had contributed to uh, making this a uh, successful event all the best you, and uh, uh, take care Thank you, you once again. Yeah. Yes, thank you once again and see you sometime soon again. Yes.